Welcome back, uh, Mike J, to the second instalment of Cactus Day from the Australian Psychedelic Society. Um, just for those who didn't catch it last year, uh, we felt that Cactus deserves its own day. So we chose May the 23rd to celebrate Aldous Huxley's uh, landmark experience with Mesclin. Um, so welcome back, Mike. Uh, Thanks very much, Jeff. It's a real pleasure to be back again. And I'm really pleased that the Cactus Day initiative is kind of rolling on and um, gaining strength. Yeah, let's hope it, it, it snowballs into something quite significant. Um, so if you'd just like to give us a quick overview of uh, yourself, your work, your bio. Sure, yeah, I'm basically a um, writer. Um, I curate exhibitions a bit as well and stuff. Um, I do, I've done a lot of stuff around the history of science and medicine, um, uh, particularly about the history of kind of madness and mental illness and psychiatry, but then kind of my main thing has really been uh, history of drugs and um, psychoactive um, plants and um, chemicals and looking at how they kind of came into Western culture and how we got here. And I guess my main qualification for that is uh, this is my this is my most recent book which is uh, Mescaline a global history of the first psychedelic just just um, coming out in paperback there and that was yeah that was what we, we chewed through very enjoyably last time. Mm, absolutely and it is a very definitive overview and perhaps the only definitive overview of the history of Mescaline to date I believe. It is at this point, although um, uh, Michael Pollan's new book, which we, which is out in uh, this summer in July, um, is a collection of essays, including one about uh, mescaline, mm. uh, where he, um, uh, yeah, he, he picks up on some of this stuff and also uh, d um, digs further into. Um, uh, has a great uh, mescaline sulfate trip and digs further into the story of, of Wachuma. So I think we can be expecting all that to hit the mainstream soon. That's that, that's great because I think the title of your book, uh, or the subtitle of the book, The uh, First Psychedelic, um, people see that and they, they don't quite get what it means. Um, but yeah, often people like Pollen start the history of modern psychedelics with Albert Hoffman's discovery of LSD in 1943. That's right. It completely obfuscates, you know, 50, 60 years of mescaline experimentation in the European world. Yeah, um, that's really what I was getting at with my subtitle. I mean, I'm not trying to say, you know, I, don't, I think it's, it's impossible to like go back into deep prehistory and say how people first altered their consciousness. But exactly. I think, you know, the word psychedelic you know, it's a modern Western word, you know, it's about modern ideas of the mind. Uh, I think it's kind of hard to impose it back on ancient history. We'll probably get into this a bit, but then we'll see that things that we call psychedelics um, were seen in very much the same way as um, other plants like tobacco and indeed alcohol, fermented fruit, things that we don't call psychedelic. So when I say the first psychedelic, I mean that when Huxley on um, Cactus Day did his first um, mescaline trip, um, when he coined the word psychedelic, there was really, that was just LSD and mescaline at that point. LSD, as you say, you know, had been recently discovered in the laboratory by Albert Hoffman, but mescaline had a way, way longer history that went way back. So that's my focus. Yeah, right. So we're talking uh, 1896 from memory? Yeah, 18, um, it's all happened very fast in the, in, in the 1890s. That was, uh, and it really happened, uh, as a result of um, sort of Western doctors and ethnographers uh, discovering the um, uh, peyote plains religion uh, on the you know out in the um, southwest um, you know in the reservations where the um, Native American population were being held in forced captivity, that was where white Westerners first uh, witnessed and. Uh, you know, it joined in uh, peyote ceremonies and it was the peyote that was brought back then to, uh, uh, you know, to the East Coast and to the universities and to the scientists. And then you had an amazing flourishing at that point of uh, self experiments with peyote, um, people from all kinds of, with all kinds of different interests, you know, scientists and neurologists wondering how it worked in the brain, um, psychologists wondering what it um, did in the mind, you know, as philosophers, people like William James mm. kind of wanted about you know what it 
it meant about reality and people like Havelock Ellis, you know, sort of art critics, aesthetes kind of writing about the aesthetic dimension of the experience. So yeah, that first um, wave of scientific experiments way back in the 19th century was incredibly diverse and uh, of course very hands-on. Right, yeah. Our focus on, on this psychedelic, uh, on this, sorry, this Cactus Day is Wachuma San Pedro and we sort mm -hmm. of decide that primarily because it's the dominant species grown in Australia. Um, so when was that exactly discovered? By the well, um, by, by Western science, it was really, I mean, I guess in the late 1940s was the um, first time that, uh, um, you know, in Peru, ethnographers and people started noticing that it was being used in ceremonies and suspected that it was mind altering. And uh, through the 1950s, it became, uh, it became clear that it was, and it was kind of by the end of the 1950s that, uh, you know, masculine was uh, definitively identified as uh, being present in the uh, Wachuma and San Pedro cacti. And they were very, um, you know, it, it was very late because, um, uh, that, you know, that was really its conduit, the way it found its way into Western culture was from those um, cities on the northern coast of uh, Peru, places like uh, Trujillo and Casma, where there were curanderos using Wachuma, uh, but it was pretty underground because it was illegal. I mean, not because of any drug laws, but because of like witchcraft and sorcery laws that were still going on there. Uh, and anthropologists were also, they kind of looked at it from a distance and they kind of saw that this wasn't some pure ancient tradition. This was kind of a messy, urban, mestizo, syncretic thing that involved, you know, maybe some pre-Hispanic stuff, but also a whole bunch of Catholic stuff and kind of a general new age stuff. So uh, that was the kind of thing that uh, anthropologists in those days were a bit dismissive of. So yeah, it was really the 1960s before um, the West had any idea that um, Wachuma, you know, was uh, a major psychedelic and had been used in Andean culture for millennia. Well, okay. But the, the Jesuits, uh, the, um, you know, Spanish um, invaders, mm -hmm. they, they, they made observations of, of traditional San Pedro rituals, did they not? Yeah, they did, um, as some did with uh, ayahuasca as well, but they didn't take it themselves. So, yeah, there was sort of... Uh, um, Bernabe Cobo was a, 19, was a 17th century Jesuit who wrote about this a bit in Peru and he said uh, there's this cactus that um, the, the Indians take and when they take it they kind of um, see visions or get possessed by the devil or whatever. So it was kind of known that it was associated um, with sort of uh, you know, witchcraft or magical practices, but nobody had really kind of properly made the connection between, okay, this cactus contains this chemical, which is psychoactive. Right, right. So they, so they hadn't really taken too much notice of the, the actual specificities of the customs and the rituals, perhaps the admixtures, uh, things like that. And what, what do we know about that sort of earlier, um, you know, pre-European use of San Pedro. Yeah, I, as you say, um, admixtures, it's always, it, it, it's used as part of a complex, um, which pretty much always includes tobacco and also quite often um, Brugmansia, uh, Datura, uh, Floripondio, as it's called. So there are a couple of um, ethnic groups like in the south of Ecuador and places who still use it traditionally and, uh, yeah, that's, um, that's what they do. They use it in various different ways um, as, a, as a purgative, uh, also as a kind of um, uh, therapy for um, anxiety or susto as they call it, kind of a, if your spirit leaves you. Uh, and also, um, you know, for, for, for kind of um, visionary um, healing and um, seeing the hidden causes of things. Okay, and so is it, is it used like a like a diagnostic tool as, as ayahuasca is in, in some traditions or, or is it more of a community activity? Uh, it, no, it's usually more of a kind of um, uh, sort of one on one, um, like a, a, a consultation. Uh, it may be about healing, but it may also be about um, 
you know, if you're unlucky in love or you believe that someone's put a curse on you or you want to see what's happening with a relative in a distant place. And healing is kind of part of that complex. It's all about um, what they say, sort of vista, kind of magical sight. It helps you to see things that you can't normally see. And that would include the causes of disease. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think what, what they, what you referred to in your book. Um, oh, I'm missing the reference now, uh, related to the House of the Sun. The yeah, that's there. right. I mean, that's, um, that's from the sort of uh, Mexican sources about peyote, uh, which is kind of, okay. um, uh, which is, um, you know, there are a few fragments of um, poetry and sort of uh, Nahua poetry that oh. the Spanish transcribed. And um, they, yeah, talking about peyote in that context is something that takes you up to the, up to the realm of the sun. So it's kind of like, it's a sort of metaphor that I like um, for psychedelics generally. It's kind of the idea that you're stepping up an energetic level, you know, kind of what was, um, you know, solid becomes kind of light and, uh, you know, what was um, bound by time becomes eternal and you're kind of going up to this level where you can see things that you can't normally see. And is, so is there a, um, a parallel uh, sort of conceptual framework for, for San Pedro in the Andean traditions? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, yeah, it, it, it's talked about in terms of light, uh, being able to see things and objects catching the light. So um, what's uh, the sort of central uh, thing that um, curanderos use with San Pedro these days is a mesa, a table, which sits in between the curandero and the, you know, the, 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 and the person who's come for the consultation, which has a whole bunch of different objects on it. Uh, uh, personal objects, you know, talismans, things that relate to the Corindero, particularly um, effigies of saints, you know, pictures of prayers, quite a lot of Catholic stuff, um, bottles, scent, um, there's always tobacco there, and, um, you know, uh, things like feathers and seashells. And I think that's kind of lent itself, you know, to um, the kind of globalization of the Wachuma ritual, because it's always been a bit syncretic, you know, every, um, uh, every healer just has their own um, objects which they lay out in front of them and then when the wachuma kind of takes hold then they say as they say certain objects kind of catch the light and you pull out one or two of these and you know like you might with a tarot reading pull out two or three cards and you uh base the consultation around that i've noticed that myself actually that's that's something quite unique to san pedro and that particularly if you're out in nature and that you can just look at a tree and and the shape and the form of the tree will actually reflect some subconscious internal pattern and therefore you you really just all you need to do is observe and it teaches really. yeah and, and I, I find also certain things catch the light you can see why in those cultures the sort of feathers of tropical birds and um you know the mother of pearl of seashells and uh you know uh rocks and crystals you know there are certain things in nature where you know the essence of nature seems to be very very kind of vividly captured and crystallized and you know those always seem to me to pop out on uh, um wachuma or um peyote yeah it seems that focus becomes a sort of central theme of, of mescaline yeah so, that's right that's good uh, i sh um shouldn't trail it too much but uh, uh michael pollan writes um writes up his mescaline trip, I think very beautifully in his new book and uh, talks about, um, about, about, about vision and the kind of ecstasy of sight and seeing in that respect. Yeah, as did Elder Saxley in, in his trousers. Yeah, exactly, exactly yeah. that. So I guess if we go right back when we're talking about, you know, the first psychedelic, I mean, there is some, you know, veracity to using that term because, you know, the, uh, there was a discovery of, preserved San Pedro in a cave from some eight and a half thousand years ago. Is it the yeah. uh, Guataro, Guatarero yeah, cave? That's right. Yeah, that, that, that's in northern Peru, um, yeah, where it, where it grows a lot. Um, yeah, that's quite, I mean, and, and that's also a part of that part of the Andes particularly is, um, uh, you know, from around that time period, so very, very early on, much earlier than anything we've found in Europe. 
um, there are traces of tobacco and coca leaf and cactus um, from around that time. Um, from more recent, I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago, has the um, this mummified um, uh, body was found up in the Andes with a medicine pouch. Uh, Made out of that, that, was kind of, that, that was a real sort of pharmacopoeia, wasn't it? There was mm. sort of harmaline from uh, you know uh, ayahuasca bark, and uh, there was um, an adenanthera sort of DMT containing seeds and coca. So I think uh, we can certainly say that uh, wachuma was part of this kind of um, you know big mind-altering plant complex that go that goes way way back in that part of the world. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so what's the connection with the uh, that cave finding to, to Chavin? Are they geographically close? Um, yeah, uh, that, yeah, yeah. Chavin is the sort of, you know, the first real kind of big material um, cultural evidence that we have for the presence of uh, San Pedro. And this is a kind of... Uh, Still very mysterious, um, fascinating, beautiful temple site high up in the Andes. Uh, and um, so much later than that cave, um, but still like 3000 years ago, there's a bas relief carving in the, uh, on the temple wall there of a um, figure, a sort of um, uh, figure with kind of big eyes and um, large fangs and um, snakes for hair and with kind of jaguar claws holding this big uh, wachuma cactus. So that's kind of what, uh, that, you know, that's, that's the first, um, you know, material evidence we have that really pinpoints wachuma in this amazing um, ancient civilization. Yeah, so, so, so to contextualize that for, for people that don't know anything about uh, Chavin de Huantar, this was a this was a civilization built around the use of San Pedro with a giant circular underground labyrinth that mm -hmm. uh, for all intents and purposes seemed to be solely to journey initiates through the underworld on San Pedro and other substances such as uh, Yopo snuffs. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's um, it's always uh, you're always guessing, you know, when you uh, try and figure out how um, you know, mind altering or psychoactive plants were used in ancient cultures. But uh, um, what we can say about Chavin is that it wasn't a, a city, not a lot of people lived there. It wasn't fortified. It didn't have a military basis. It seems to have been a pilgrimage site where people came from all over uh, to have a particular experience. And we know they came from all over because these kind of this Chavin iconography, you know, these kind of figures with the claws and the fangs, you know, you find them radiating out from there, you know, all down to the Peruvian coast and all through the Andes. And, um, you know, the other thing that's really clear about it is that um, these plants were a part of it, as well as the um, that carving of the wachuma that we that that, that we mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of finds in that culture of snuff trays and snuffing tubes, often kind of um, bone snuffing tubes and trays carved with these kind of strange swirling to our modern eyes, very psychedelic kind of deities and images. And those um, trays and snuffing uh, and, and, and snuffing tubes are still used these days for um, an adenanthra, what we call yopo. So that's a, <coughs> that's a, um, a, a 5-MeO DMT containing um, snuff made from a powdered um, seeds of a shrub that also grows up in that part of the world. And um, Wachuma, I should say, still grows all around Chavin when we're allowed out again. If anybody makes it to the Chavin site, you'll see, you know, fantastic, huge Wachuma specimens kind of all around the site. And you're up in the sort of high Andes there and the plateaus where it's very windy. People cultivate Wachuma as a windbreak. You'll see isolated houses in the middle of nowhere and um, people have kind of big Wachuma sort of um, fences all around their houses to keep the wind out. And if you go down to the coast and go to the witchcraft markets in the cities, uh, then there are stalls of people, you know, selling uh, wachuma that's been harvested from up there because it kind of it wants to be, uh, that um, tropical uh, uh, latitude. It wants to be, um, you know, at about two thousand um, 
uh, meters or so. So uh, it, there's always been, and there, and there seems to have been even back in ancient times, a uh, you know a trafficking uh, trade route from San Pedro from the mountains down to the coast because uh, you know it's also been uh, you know San Pedro traces and kind of rolls of skin have also been found yeah. at sites down on the coast. So we're looking at an ancient network there. Yeah, no doubt. And so when you say Wachuma, that's I take it probably <laughs> referring to several subspecies in the Trichocereus genus. So we're talking about Pachinoi, yep. Peruvianus, Regisei. Uh, yep. All of those would be up there? Yes, because Coensis, um, a little bit further south. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it still seems to me um, you'd have to get Keeper Trout on to uh, right. talk about this if you had a, you had a few hours a few hours to spare but you know the genus still seems to be pretty much in flux i mean wachuma and or sort of achuma these are the sort of the, the names in the um uh, uh quechua and aymara languages uh you know up and down the andes from uh, ecuador through um uh, peru down to bolivia and down to argentina and chile uh, they don't um, obviously use the Western taxonomy. Uh, they're much more interested in how many columns it has. You know, fours, very rare. Fives and sixes, most common. Sevens, very special. Uh, you know, so you're into a whole, um, whole different taxonomy. But also, you know, when you go up and down those um, Andean valleys, you know, they're hugely sort of deep and very isolated from one another. And you kind of go up and like switch back up to a sort of uh, uh, pass and come down the other side and the Wachuma on the other side looks quite different. And um, is this a different species or is it a subspecies or is it possible that, <clears throat> you know, from a long time back then human populations have been selecting, you know, maybe selecting exactly, one yeah. with higher mescaline content or shorter spines or whatever. So uh, yeah, all that variation that we're having trouble pinning down, you know, maybe um, something about, you know, a long-term relationship between humans and the cactus. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I think one of the most fascinating and unique aspects of the Chavin complex is, is the use of sound there that the, the uh, archaeoacoustologists or acoustic mm -hmm. archaeologists have uh, uncovered. Um, yeah, what do you yeah. tell us about that? Yeah, well, it's kind of, um, the site is in that sort of very classic um, uh, sort of, uh, indigenous American style of a sort of um, plaza and pyramid, you know, so there's a big plaza courtyard um, facing a pyramid, which would probably, you know, it would have been suitable for kind of, you know, large gatherings, you know, large rituals, you know, we can speculate about whether, you know, um, you know, in, in that context, people, you know, people were brewing chicha beer at that time out of out of corn you know that could you know it, which you which you could add wachuma to maybe so um uh you know so that's possible and then the pyramid behind them behind it has kind of um platforms where you know sort of uh, priests or people um you know kind of uh, um sort of uh, guiding the ceremony might stand. But what's so interesting about the pyramid at Chavin is that it's hollow and you can go inside into this amazing labyrinth of tunnels. And it seems to be deliberately a labyrinth. It's all full of, uh, you know, kind of twists and turns to disorientate you and block out the light. Uh, there's a stream running through there that's been diverted. So you hear the water running through. That's, this is the kind of, uh, you know, clearly sort of acoustic engineering uh, that you, you're mentioning. And there's also, um, you know, fragments of, uh, of, 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 of mirror, you know, made from stone and um, seashells and things to bounce the light around. And right in the very center, uh, there are these kind of tiny little chambers that you get into, which have these um, carved pillars um, sort of uh, with, uh, you know, sort of uh, the faces and images of deities on them. So it um, looks like that that was used uh, in some kind of initiatic context that uh, people would go in there probably singly because it's you know very small and constrained and there are little kind of monk like cells off the side where I guess people could um, uh, you know sort of uh, be you know incubate them themselves or sort of incubate their dreams and visions so yeah it's all it, it all looks like it's very experiential and it's very about um, cultivating a type of vision and connection with the divine that it was, could, could only happen there and um, yeah, it's very clear from the material evidence that, um, you know, this um, uh, 
psychoactive plants are involved you know so uh, that's a very very uh, you know rich bunch of uh, material for us to think about and conjure with yeah i think the uh, the discovery of the conch shell there too was was pretty good mm. evidence that the sound was used to modulate the experience of, of the initiative yeah. Yeah, that's right. And as, and as you say, sort of, uh, pe uh, you know, people looking at the archaeo acoustics of it have done kind of really good work on this, trying to piece together what it must have been like. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, that is that is tricky. So we, we, we don't really know whether it was something that everyone participated in or it was a chosen few, whether it was a, a rite of initiation passage for, for you know, um, young adults or do we know any of that sort of stuff? No, we don't. I mean, except what we can, um, uh, you know, what we can put together from, uh, you know, from our knowledge of the uh, of, of the plants and their effects, you know, and uh, the fact that uh, Wachuma is kind of a very, very good platform for, uh, you know, a big um, uh, snuff of a strong tryptamine. Um, so to me, this kind of plaza and pyramid thing suggests the idea that there might be uh, something that was more of a group ceremony, which was an induction into something that was then kind of like a shorter and more intense individual experience that took place in the labyrinthine darkness inside the pyramid. Yeah, it seems very much like a, a journey through the underworld and then re-emerging mm. into society as, as a fully initiated member just through the, the structure of it, I guess. But I'm yeah, and, and people clearly took it back to where they came from because then you see all this imagery, as I said, proliferating, you know, sort of uh, hundreds of miles in every direction. Yeah, yeah. And in uniting the, um, the yeah, the guy, uh, Julio Teo, the uh, Peruvian archaeologist who discovered this, his, uh, his thing was that, you know, this was a place where it was up in the mountains, but you could tell from all the jaguar imagery that people from the jungle were there. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, because you found the cactus down on the coast, there were really three different um, cultures in Peru, as there still are. There's the coast, there's the mountains and the jungle. So his idea was that, uh, you know, Chavin was the place where all these three came together and they forged a kind of group consciousness and, uh, you know, group Andean culture. Yeah, yeah, it does have that sort of um, mythos of, of being a, a, an entirely peaceful place and, and somewhere where people sort of put down their tribal disagreements and, and you know, came together yeah. for that sort of purpose, a unifying uh, experience. Yeah, and that's what the, you know, it, it seems that the, you know, the way that um, this kind of complex culture emerged there was was also like that, you know, because because of our sort of um, models in Europe and the Middle East, um, you know, like Egypt and Mesopotamia, we've always tended to think of civilization coming together because one group controls irrigation or some resource. So immediately, uh, civilization is very hierarchical and stratified. Um, but if you look at how that all, all came together in, um, you know, in, in the Andes and off the sort of coast of Peru there, it was some people producing cotton, you know, which uh, people who were fishing were using for nets. And uh, it seems much more uh, cooperative, much more about a bunch of people, uh, you know, with, you know, coming from, you know, because of the Andes, you've got all these different uh, ecosystems. It's a bunch of, it's a cooperation between people uh, who've evolved, you know, the, the cultures for their own ecosystem, um, kind of sharing and uh, networking and and um, patching it all together. And uh, yeah, the sort of Julio Teo's idea of Chavin fits with that very nicely. Yeah, great. So we also know that it was abandoned after some 1500 years of continual use. Is there mm -hmm. any evidence to tell us why? Or can we tell from the rise of other civilizations, perhaps the Aztecs or, you know? The yeah, we can. Problem? I mean, a lot of the um, sort of, uh, I mean, Chavin is very much a mother culture for that whole part of the Andes. So after that, like cultures on the Peruvian coast, like the Moche and the Chimu have a lot of um, those elements in, and also, uh, you know, seem to have used Wachuma as well. Uh, and then um, further south in Bolivia, like the um, 
to Anako culture and the Wari culture when they arise. Um, they've also got part of the same complex in. And then um, the Incas, you know, uh, Teo was, the, was also the first person to identify this big statue figure in the center of the Chavin labyrinth with some of the uh, Inca deities and pantheons. So I guess uh, we can see Chavin as this, you know, huge cultural um, sort of spiritual religious hub out of which um, enormous complex of uh, different Andean cultures emerged. Fantastic. So there's a lot more to discover there about Chavin. Um, and I assume there's some academics that, you know, have that as their specialty field. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, since then, older places have been found, you know, like Caral, kind of closer to the coast, huge pyramid cultures, you know, I mean, pyramids older than any pyramids in Egypt. And, you know, I, that's, that site is, um, I mean, I went there some years ago, but there was still kind of no road through it, really. You needed four wheel drive to get anywhere and you climb the top of the pyramid that's been excavated and you're looking through this enormous river valley up to the Andes and boom, 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 boom. You can see all these other pyramids that are still unexcavated. So, uh, yeah, I guess for, uh, you know, budding archaeologists, you know, compared with, uh, you know, the sort of long waiting list to do any kind of tiny bits of excavation in uh, somewhere like, like here in Britain, um, then yeah, that's that, that's really an open field. So is there a, is there a, a museum of, of the Chavin artifacts? No, no, there are some of them are in the um, National Museum in Lima. Um, there's a fantastic, um, you know, carved um, sort of uh, um, bass relief stone there you know one of the most famous beautiful ones so it's been patched into that but things like um the wachuma you know in the shaman's hands that's still just kind of right you know right on, on on the wall there in the temple in the open air mm -hmm. it's, it's quite a common image and we should insert it here too because i think a lot of people would have seen it um yeah and once they see it they'll immediately recognize it yeah uh, the little guy holding the cactus yeah, yeah that's right yeah so um how do we get from the discovery of mescaline in trichocereia species to it sort of entering into western psychedelia i mean you, you touched on that initially but is there, is there a sort of cultural marker at which we can sort of pinpoint yeah. yeah i guess the, the first um yeah i mean that well that there's quite a lot of um Peruvian and South American ethnographers and um, botanists writing about it in the 40s and 50s. Um, but I think what really carries it into the sort of beginning of Western psychedelic culture is a um, uh, guy called Douglas Sharon, who was at, uh, um, a, an anthropologist at, at, at UCLA. And he wrote a piece which you can find in that um, great uh, Peter First edited collection, um, Hallucinogens and Culture, I think it's called, you know, which is oh, one of the Peter first, Peter. Um, mm. yeah, yeah, one of the first collect that sort of introduced a whole bunch of this stuff. And um, Sharon was up in, uh, yeah, in the, in the, in the north, um, in the north of Peru and uh, apprenticed um, with a curandero up in one of the northern cities there. He was also at um, UCLA at the same time as um, Carlos Castaneda. Uh, so it's very much that generation. And by that time, I think the, um, uh, you know, the way that Wachuma was being used in Curandero ceremonies there, it had, um, it was very, very, very Catholic, you know, uh, looking, um, people calling it San Pedro rather than Wachuma, you know, lots of saints effigies, lots of, you know, um, you know, it was very much, um, you know, fitted itself in with the broader, um, Catholic culture around it, but also already by that time, you know, pulling in, you know, bits of Eastern mysticism, a kind of general mm -hmm. sort of um, grab bag of sort of new age ideas that was starting to emerge, just as like if you look at, um, say, Pablo Amaringo's ayahuasca art, you know, sort of around that time that's starting to pull in, you know, UFOs and kind of Western yeah, no, imagery. Right. Uh, so there was a really kind of rich stew going on there. And I think, um, you know, because of that, it made it quite easy to take the elements of it and repurpose it. And, um, you know, there was, uh, you know, it wasn't like one of these um, closed societies like the Wichol, you know, where um, shamanism is something that's, you know, 
very much uh, an expression of the society. This was much more kind of open-ended and free and easy and people coming at it from different directions. So I think that's kind of, that's how it started to make its way out. But still, you know, all the way through the rest of the 20th century, um, there was not a lot of Wachuma in Western psychedelic culture. Mm. It's really, um, you know, I guess in the last, um, sort of 10, 15 years, it's really started to emerge. And I think um, I think part of that is, you know, people coming to realize the intense, uh, you know, cultivation uh, and supply and conservation pressures on peyote. Um, you know, that it's, um, you know, it's, it, it's really not cool unless you have an ethical source to be kind of um, wandering into sort of um, Texas and Mexico and uh, picking a bunch of peyote because, um, you know, there's, you know, demand outstrips supply so much. And then I think uh, that's focused people's minds on the fact that, well, there is also Wachuma and, you know, it grows incredibly fast. It's very tolerant. It'll grow anywhere. It grows all up and down the Andes. There's enormous amounts of it. Um, you can kind of pick it anywhere and you can grow it. You know, I mean, I, 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 I grow it here in, in Britain. You know, it's very, very tolerant. Um, it grows, it grows very fast. It's a really beautiful plant to grow. So uh, I think, uh, I, I think all that has kind of pushed it to the sort of forefront of the sort of, uh, you know, contemporary psychedelic culture as well. That's great. Yeah, we're starting to see the old um, predominant cultivar of, of Pachinoy pop up in the commercial garden centres here and, and, and the prices are sort of starting to skyrocket. Someone's even called it a bubble here, a cactus bubble. <laughs> right. And that's well, just a reflection of, of psychedelics popularity, I guess. Yeah, and it's a very benign one as well because, um, you know, once, what, you know, once your um, what tumors put on some growth, you can harvest it, you can take the top and plant that and now it'll, it'll pop again from the bottom. So every time you uh, harvest one, you make two more, you know, so uh, yeah. it can propagate. And if, yeah, there's certainly places in California, places in Mexico, like Oaxaca, where I've seen, you know, where people have got going on this, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And, um, you know, there's just uh, wonderful, you know, fantastically, you know, huge and really diverse and beautiful Wachuma populations spreading around the world now. Yeah, that's certainly the case in Australia too. And, and right. as you said before, with the, uh, the Christian element, I guess that's very much tied as, as, as sort of um, the Mazatec mushroom ceremonies and, and the witch old peyote ceremonies to disguising their practices from the, the threat of, you know, religious uh, colonization. So they would sort of, you know, if, if they were suspected of, you know, running a, a, cactus ceremony they could say oh no look we've just got a christian ceremony going on and that's partly the reason i think there's you know the saints involved but who was it a jesuit missionary that coined the term saint peter given that it's uh well saint pedro given that it's saint peter the gates to heaven i mean there's got yeah, to be no, a connection I think, there. I think these terms kind of emerge i don't think it's so much of a deliberate strategy i think um you know once kind of indigenous american populations were converted to Christianity, they kind of saw the power of these Christian images. And so um, they saw also, you know, that this was the iconography they were allowed to use. So they very quickly used the permitted iconography to, uh, you know, describe and talk about and represent and pray to, um, you know, the deities that were there before, but also, you know, that Christianity, you know, Christian gods and saints are believed to be extremely potent, you know, um, so, uh, uh, you know, they're not, um, uh, you know, this is, you know, this is much more, you know, this is not a monotheistic culture. Uh, you know, you take all the sources of power that are available to you. Uh, so I think, um, I think, you know, in a sense, it's not a, a, a strategy of concealment, you know, it's, a, it's an attempt to kind of claim that power. But then at the same time, I think because um, peyote and wachuma were prohibited, then they became, in a way that they hadn't been before, distinctive markers of indigenous culture. You know, so uh, I think there's these two different things in tension. You know, on the one hand, this is something that's um, taking you back to your pre-Hispanic roots, but on the other hand, you know, this is also something that can, uh, you know, uh, that can, you know, attract the, the new kind of religious dispensation to work for you. Right, so is it, is it fair to say though that 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 sort of attitude arises through the, the Jesuit missionaries 
acknowledging the uh, religious power that the cactus had, that they saw that it very much had a similar role uh, to the Christian Eucharist. Yeah, no, and in in, certainly in their first encounters uh, with all these plants, we see it more clearly in, in Mexico because that was a bit sort of earlier and more heavily occupied. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard. To, it, you know, the Jesuits were extremely struck by the fact that this looked a bit like the Catholic mass, you know, that people would um, uh, stand around kind of with heads bowed, you know, very solemn while a priest went round and handed them the thing to mm -hmm. eat, they'd eat with a prayer. And, uh, uh, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was very difficult for the, um, to, for the missionaries to make sense of this and to, uh, to, to understand that it was kind of uncomfortably close to what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were, of course, coming from this, uh, you know, Europe that was in the grip of the witch craze. And so their first uh, idea when they looked at it was, you know, this is the devil's work. The devil is kind of, you know, um, parodying the Eucharist and deceiving the natives. And it's our duty to, uh, you know, enlighten them and save their souls. So, yeah, it's all it's all part of that. Um, those are those ideas, which are the ideas that the, um, you know, the, 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 the Europeans arrived in yeah. uh, the Americas with. And I'm sure had they tasted it, uh, they, they would have probably confirmed their biases too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, they don't seem to, uh, but but it's also one of the reasons that they um, prohibit it. I mean, you know, tobacco is also prohibited you know, mm. in some places as well. It's not just what we think of now as um, as psychedelics, um, but it was partly about um, conversing the natives, but also it was a lot about um, uh, you know, the emergence in Mexico, particularly of a mestizo culture, kind of Spanish Indian culture and people with Spanish um, uh, ancestry getting interested in um, peyote and San Pedro and indigenous magic and kind of sorcery, you know, so um, it was almost as much about stamping down on their own people as it was on, uh, you know, the sort of indigenous natives and that survives in some places, you know, like with the Huichol, for example, in Mexico, who, you know, where people uh, who like the Native American church have a kind of exclusion, a sort of permission for to use peyote, you know, so it's kind of, in a way, there's also this thing that as long as it's only the indigenous people doing it, it's all right, you know, what's really concerning is, uh, you know, when it starts to, uh, to bite back, as it were. Mm. And there certainly are, you know, you can observe the, the rise of, you know, ayahuasca retreats incorporating San Pedro, um, mm. Any specific San Pedro retreats in, in the Sacred Valley, um, and it's good to see a, a lot of recent uh, publications into mescaline, uh, peer-reviewed journals. Some, you know, the resurgence of study into mescaline um, in the overall psychedelic renaissance. Yeah, it's just. I mean, I think for a long time, um, I mean, the early psychedelic renaissance was very much driven by kind of. Um, sort of PR and how things looked. So um, uh, there was, um, you know, I think, you know, psilocybin, for example, you know, people didn't immediately associate it with magic mushrooms. It sounded sciencey, you know, so I think that was, you know, it was chosen, you know, as kind of for, to sort of fly under the radar slightly, you know, and also, you know, as Rick Doblin has said, you know, his choice of, you know, using military veterans as his kind of uh, test subjects for MDMA therapy was about kind of, um, you know, making it appeal to, uh, you know, outside the, you know, what people think of as the psychedelic culture. So I think mescaline had a lot of strikes against it at the beginning because it was around so early on, it had been criminalized really early on, you know, it was kind of, it had been schedule one, you know, since the sort of 60s and 70s and, uh, uh, whereas it was really quite easy to get, um, you know, relatively easy to get, uh, you know, trials licensed with something like ketamine that was already a licensed medicine. Uh, mescaline was a lot of paperwork and a lot of hurdles. And it was also, um, it's also very long acting. And um, mm. I think this is, I think, you know, most, most psychotherapists kind of want a session that lasts for an hour or two, you know, and there's a, thing. Like, a bit kind of long for them, you know, this is all a bit expensive once you start, you know, totting up the, you know, your hours of, um, you know, sort of professional medical fees. Mm. Um, so like a really long acting psychedelic like mescaline was kind of, was less appealing, but we're just started, there's a, um, a kind of um, 
ethical pharmaceutical company in California called uh, Journey Colab, who are just starting to work with mescaline. Uh, and they're very interested in um, the, the kind of the kind of group therapy um, that uh, that you see in the uh, in, in the Native American church. And also it has its Western analogs in things like um, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, you know, so uh, um, it's very hard when you're doing FDA trials to kind of um, do anything except, you know, these kind of clinical laboratory controlled settings. But they're kind of working with mescaline and wondering if that can also be part of a new kind of therapy, which is much less about, you know, the private individual being treated by the expert psychotherapist and a bit more about kind of, you know, a sort of group healing circle, you know, with a less kind of clinical vibe and more embedded in the community and kind of longer term community support. So I think, um, you know, the fact that mescaline come, ha has now a slightly different history from the other psychedelics also gives it the possibility that it can be used to uh, broaden out our ideas of what 21st century, um, you know, psychedelic therapy might look like. That's great. Yeah, because the sort of the group setting is probably more uh, in line with with traditional cactus use, you know, the the, the TP ceremony uh, for one. Um, yeah. I just mean, I think back to what I forgot I was going to say before. Uh, so what is the cultural status of San Pedro in Peru, given that it's not protected by the domains of the Native American church, yet mm -hmm. the retreats are, for all intents and purposes, legal? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you can, I mean, even in, in Lima, you know, if you go to one of those kind of big covered markets, uh, you'll usually find uh, there's still well, people selling coca leaves, obviously, and uh, some of the people who do that will also be selling kind of meter lengths of wachuma, so you, you can pick it up in the market easily enough, yeah. yeah so so it's, it's not criminalised at all, but it's not technically legal or, or protected? Under... Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, as, as far as I know, it's not legal and it's not protected. I mean, once you're up in the sort of high Andes, you know, up at 2,000 yeah. metres, yeah. it's just kind of you know, big bare barren cliffs with huge great candelabras of San Pedro stretching all the way to the horizon. It's just like, can you be bothered to scramble up the scree slopes and, um, you know, harvest it and stick it in the back of your four by four and take it down to the coast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now that makes sense. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Um, so where can people find you and buy your book and check out your other works? Cool. You should be able to, um, uh, you can find me at mikej.net uh, is my website. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at mikejnet. You can find Mescaline in, um, well, in, on Amazon if you must, but, uh, you know, most, in, mostly in, in bookshops. Still out in hardback. Um, this, the paperback that I flashed at you earlier is uh, on sale in the States. I think it's... Um, I think it's published in Australia in June, July or something. So you can you can hang on for that if you like. And um, yeah, great. Well, it's a real pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, you too, Mike. Thank you very great. much. Happy Cactus Day. <laughs> and happy Cactus Day to you too.